<laughs> My name is Manjil Bhargava. Yes. Uh, I'm a mathematician at Princeton University. Okay. We guess we should start with the uh, sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, you have a uh, an honor that most mathematicians don't have. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Fields Medal? Um, it's a prize that's given every four years at the International Congress of Mathematicians, uh, up to four people every four years, because mm -hmm. uh, the Congress is held every four years. Uh, it has a strange age limit, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was not officially in the... Uh, Original uh, charter? Yeah, <laughs> in the charter for the, okay. for the medal. Uh, unclear how it... <laughs> how it developed and whether that's a good thing. <laughs> good thing for <laughs> you, We'll talk yes. about that, yeah. Now, our, what were the other, what, what is your area and what were the area of the other Fields Medalists? Uh, you mean the year? The uh, year that you The year it. I received it? Yes. Yeah, there was a, uh, there was geometric group theory and, and geometry, there was uh, analysis. Uh, obviously, any given year you don't, you can't represent all fields. That's right. As, uh, you know, as time Just goes by, you tend to. I'm trying most to, fields. I'm trying to get a sense of the scope and the range of this. But in your area is? Uh, number theory. Number theory. Yeah. Now, number theory is a, a subtle area that um, people who don't do number theory, especially the public, fails to appreciate because it sounds like the easiest branch of mathematics because we all deal with integers. Right. And right. Uh, um, why do you think it is so subtle? In which seems paradoxical to so many people. Why, why is it so subtle? It seems to be more subtle than most areas of mathematics. Yeah, it's, it's because the questions are very deceiving, mm -hmm. <laughs> deceivingly simple, uh, which was part of the attraction uh, uh, towards the subject for me. Okay. That so many of the questions are so simple to state, and yet when you try to solve them, that same level of simple thinking does not lead to their answers. And number theory has been amazing in that it's absorbed techniques from, from geometry, from topology, from group theory, from, from so many different areas in order to, uh, uh, to tackle some of these very simple problems. It's required some very, very, as you said, subtle and, and deep techniques from a variety of fields in order to, to solve some of these questions that are just so simple to state where you don't need to know anything. Yes. And I think that's what makes it so subtle because in a lot of other subjects, even the questions are difficult to state. And then yes. when you answer them, they're about on the same level of difficulty. I mean, usually, obviously, the difficulty goes higher when you go, go to answer them. But for number theory, that's, that difference is especially marked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's hard to talk about number theory in Princeton without mentioning Andrew Wiles. Yeah. And, uh, and because he also drew upon other areas to augment n standard number theory. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there a... Um, First off, do you know him? Is he still there? Do you work with yeah, him? Yeah, no, he was my advisor. He was my your PhD advisor. advisor. Yeah, yeah. I did not know. Um, and yeah, and wonderful as a PhD advisor, he has this fantastic global view of mathematics, which you can tell from his famous proof, of course. Yes. But uh, he has a real sense of of the relative importance of different fields and how they interrelate and how they influence each other. And uh, that's a great quality to have an advisor. So I didn't uh, work on the areas that he works in directly, okay. but having him as advisor just to look at the stuff I was doing and sort of gently guide me and, uh, or push me in certain directions that he felt were more promising was so certainly very helpful. Uh, and just to have that kind of global perspective from somebody like that was, uh, was amazing. We miss him. Uh, he left for Oxford a few years ago. Oh, I did not know. Uh, to go back home. Uh, I hadn't miss, heard about him. We miss him there a lot. Yeah. There you Well, uh, can you at least shed some light on the, the rumor that he uh, shut himself into an attic for five years and then suddenly appeared with the proof all at once. <laughs> I mean, is that a caricature of the, what really happened or not? Well, actually, I hadn't arrived in Princeton yet. <laughs> so oh. I heard the same rumors when I arrived. <laughs> okay. I, I can't attest to how truthful, <laughs> okay. how exactly accurate they were. I imagine they were somewhat true, but I don't think it's like, literally true. <laughs> well, this, the, the reason I ask is because it might affect how he taught you to view the creation process. So he was your mentor, so did he view, think that you should keep results close to your chest for a long time or, or be more open like most scientists are? 
Mm, he certainly never recommended that I go shut myself in an attic. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, he did recommend that I sit on things for a little while and I let them uh, uh, sort of rest in my mind for a while until they, they sort of naturally take the next step and not prematurely uh, think that I've gone somewhere before I've really felt that I've gone somewhere. Um, and especially for his PhD students, I think this is true of many advisors, that they, they don't want their PhD students talking about their work too soon because they're teams of people working elsewhere who may be able to do it much faster than a, uh, a starting PhD student. Um, but uh, no, it was never like that. He was, he was always en encouraging to be fairly open <laughs> Very good. about uh, what I was working on, with, at least with other colleagues and fellow grad students. And, since we are at G4G, and uh, uh, we are based on the sense of finding the intersection between mathematics and recreation and arts and everything else, um, where, where was your first, who was the first time you noticed mathematics impacting the outside world? And where, well, it's everywhere you can see, of course, but where were you first drawn to? Well, in the beginning, it was just my personal experiences. I would, uh, I loved making games by myself and then trying to play with them. I, I always tell the story of how I used to like to stack oranges and pyramids. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was seven or eight years old, I'd take all the family oranges that were meant for the juicer and I'd make <laughs> pyramid structures. Uh, and I wanted to know if you take a triangular pyramid of oranges and you have this many oranges on each side, how many total oranges do you need in order to, uh, to make the whole pyramid? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, that was the first math problem that I really was excited about uh, okay. early on. And ha when I finally solved it, which took weeks, I think, uh, I found the answer that if you have n oranges on each side, the total number of oranges you need for the pyramid is n times n plus 1 times n plus 2 divided by 6. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing revelation for me that of how, of the predictive power of mathematics, that you can, you can just put in the number n into this formula and it'll tell you how many oranges you need. That was like a, that seemed like a direct connection to the real world where you have this abstract formula and it tells you, boom, this is how many oranges you need. And then you can actually build that pyramid with that many oranges and it, and it just works out perfectly. And it was number theory. Yeah. And it was number theory, yeah. <laughs> um, yesterday, you, perhaps it was today, I've forgotten. You've previously given a talk. We can edit this out. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, you gave a talk about the uh, ramifications of some number theory results some corollaries from that that lead to the principle behind a lot of magic tricks. Hmm. Um, did you have, what order did that come in? Did you know about the magic first and the applications thereof, or, or were you just sort of going back in the literature? Uh, no, I learned about the magic first. Uh, I first, uh, I mean, in, as far as my talk goes, I was talking about numbers such as 142857, which yes have this amazing property that you take its first few multiples and you just get the same digits back. Right. Uh, when, you, when you take the first six multiples of 142857, you just get cyclic permutations of the same number. Uh, yeah, I learned that as a child. Uh, I don't remember where I first learned it, but I do remember eventually hitting a Martin Gardner article about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found this number absolutely magical. And yes. of course, it has many magical applications in the sense that it's, magicians actually use this number. Uh, but I didn't know the full mathematics behind it, but I was always wondered, uh, mm -hmm. what is it that made that number tick that, the way it does? Uh, and then as I learned more number theory, of course, uh, those ingredients started to fall into place. And then are there infinitely many such numbers that have that property? Uh, those are things that started coming when you start taking graduate courses in number theory, you start making those connections. Uh, but those deep results in number theory, they're often not presented with that recreational uh, application in mind, and I think it should be, because it, it certainly excited me a lot to be able to make those connections, and it made those abstract results more concrete and connected to something that I could understand as a child, and had deep implications for those simple questions that I had as a child, even though they're very deep results in conjectures and number theory that they actually connect to, and that you can only really understand uh, when you're in graduate school. So that I found just absolutely amazing. That. Uh, that's something that really excites me about mathematics, that you can ask these simple questions that it just look like fun, and then they connect to really deep structures later on. Uh, but do you incorporate this in your teaching? Do you, because uh, number theory is always made relevant by talking about cryptography and things like that. But recreational mathematics, 
would be, I think, just equally motivating to students. Do you find you ever do that? Um, yeah, I incorporate it in my teaching all the time, absolutely. When I teach art and conjecture, art and conjecture I certainly bring up mm -hmm. uh, 142857, I bring up card shuffling. <laughs> um, and it makes it more exciting for me. And if it makes it more exciting for me, it makes it more exciting for the students. Uh, but just the fact that you can connect it to things that are so simple, mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, definitely makes it much more exciting for students. And I think Martin Gardner always said that uh, play, play should be the way that you even understand serious things. And I, I really believe that. And I try to do my best in class to do that. And I think we should really make it part of the curriculum, even starting in you know, school levels. You know, there, there's a lot of it's very taught in a very abstract, mechanical way sometimes, and I think the play aspect is, is too often ignored, and I think it should be brought in at the school level all the way up to the graduate school level. I think this is okay. something that can really be done, and it makes math, uh, well, it's what excites mathematicians when they do their work, so why don't we share that with, with the students when we teach it? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> now, we also know, because we've seen the title of your talk for um, the Sunday lecture, that you find some connections with music and, uh, and, and drumming and rhythms. Yeah. Um, do you want to remark upon that? Uh, sure, well. It's, 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 it's clearly, quote unquote, a application, but it, it, most people would view it more in, as an art than an application. Right, well, it's, uh, one of the things I was gonna talk about tomorrow is, is the fact that many of the fundamental mathematical structures that we we talk about, such as binomial coefficients or Fibonacci numbers or um, memory wheels, they, all, they sort of, they arose in history uh, for the first time by artists and poets thinking about their subject as an art. Mm -hmm. And these mathematical consequences just came. And we don't uh, really know even in India, so I'm going to talk about some of the Indian instances of this happening, yes. because I grew up in uh, this Indian musical tradition. My family had lots of Indian musicians, and so, and my grandfather is a Sanskrit scholar, so I was lucky to uh, have grown up in, in this tradition and, and got to learn some of these, uh, sort of these ancient works of literature that were mainly poet, poetry and music related, and yet they're writing about these mathematical objects. And even in India, the mathematicians are unaware of this. It's only the poets and the musicians who know about this. But in fact, in history, uh, Fibonacci numbers were first discovered by poets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a thousand years before Fibonacci, uh, binomial coefficients were discovered you know, a thousand years before Pascal. <laughs> um, yes. And so the, it really illustrates the fine line between art and mathematics. Uh, in ancient times, people didn't really separate them the way we do now. Well, let me ask you um, about one intersection that I'm guessing you've heard of, I don't know, is the Yamata Rajaba Nasalagam? Right, right. And, uh, yeah, I was going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow as well. You're going to talk about that tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. I'll make a few remarks about that then, if you could. Uh, so that's, a, that's an example of a memory wheel, where yes. if you memorize this sequence of, say, long and short syllables, it allows you to sweep out all possible, in this case, triplets of, of long and short syllables. Uh, so all eight possible long and short syllables are incorporated in this word, in this word, Yamatarajabhanasalagam. And what it allowed poets to do in ancient times is to memorize very, very long meters. And not just memorize them, but also preserve them for posterity. So what they would do is they would write poetry. Uh, so say they composed a new meter and they wanted that to be uh, held intact for all of posterity, for all, for all of history. Well, it's very easy if you have a meter and it's just consisting of long and short syllables. It's very easy for the next generation or two generations from now to flip a bit <laughs> and <laughs> one long becomes a short and the composition is destroyed. Yes. So how do you make sure that uh, your composition stays, of, your, of this meter stays intact for all history? Well, what they did is they, they used this word to encode the rhythms because mm -hmm. it has triples in it. They'd break it up into triples, they'd encode the rhythm, and they'd write a, po they'd write a poem about the meter yes. in the meter and inside the meter would be the encoding using this word. I see. And once you did that, if anything flips in that, it's like an error correction. Code. Yes. So if nice. any bit was flipped in that poem that they wrote about their meter, you'd notice that the poem was not in the meter. You'd notice that the encoding of the meter is not correct, it's not matching, and you'd know how to fix the error. So this is like an ancient error correcting code that came, came about. Just well, the it. error correction aspect is new to me. I've heard it described as an exercise, and an, I've heard it described as a sutra. 
Right. Yeah. But it but is a sutra. Yeah. Yeah. It's an error correcting sutra. Error yeah. correcting sutra. Yeah. I had no idea. I, yeah. that was, that's news to me. Um, <laughs> Now, speaking of the rhythms, before I ask you about Indian rhythms, are you acquainted with the mathematician or Godfrey Toussaint's? Yeah, I know the work? name, but I'm not familiar. He wrote with the a book called so The yeah. Geometry of Musical Rhythms. Right, right. It's a beautiful book. Yeah. I okay. recommend it to you. Okay, definitely. Okay. Geometry of musical rhythms, musical instruments, okay. musical uh, musical rhythms, mm -hmm. and um, mm. he has a very because he is a computer scientist and a mathematician, mm -hmm. but he, all, he most, mostly he was studying African rhythms, oh, okay. and so I recommend right, the right. book to oh, you. Okay, absolutely. Um, but Indian rhythms are notoriously difficult for Westerners because they're always in 15, or 13, or 19, or something like that. Um, so I guess I should start with the cultural aspect of it. Why are they? So why are these rhythms that we consider unusual so natural to the Indian ear? Yeah, the main difference uh, of Indian rhythms with Western rhythms, I guess, is their length. I mean, they just tend to be longer. Uh, they're not quick moving necessarily, but they're long. I mean, they may be quick moving within the cycle, but the cycles themselves are long. And these long cycles allow lots of play within the cycle and a build up to the downbeat because the downbeat only comes every once in a while. And yes. so you really start, so that's, um, that's a huge basis for, for the rhythmic theory of Indian music, is that you want this build up towards the downbeat. And so if, if you want that build up, you need time for that build up to happen. And so the cycles uh, tend to be long. Uh, and there are points of emphasis within the, within the cycle. Uh, you feel certain sub-downbeats you know, within the cycle, but then the main downbeat is what you sort of work towards uh, uh, and tell a story that, that sort of ends at the downbeat. Uh, that's how th the, re the historical reason for it is, is that's how the poetry was written. The poetry was in these long meters that I was telling you that they used Yamata Rajabhana so they come yes. to, to remember and to preserve for posterity. And then these long meters were there and then the music was built around that kind of poetry which was also in these long, in these long meters. Uh, and then uh, it eventually led to this way of practicing music where you had these long meters that would uh, when it came to an end, that was like the crescendo, the climax, and, used, and the music would build up uh, to that point. And that led to really intricate ways of developing a rhythmic story that led to the downbeat. And that's what makes Indian music so intricate and so complex. Are Which the short cycles don't allow room for you to do necessarily. Well, it's maybe because the Westerners are too impatient and they don't have the <laughs> desire to let these things develop fully, uh, which probably says a lot about Indian culture in general. A very patient culture, maybe. Very patient <laughs> culture. Um, the rhythms, such as you, we talked about for that sutra, are those translated directly into um, drumming rhythms, tabla rhythms, or are they just somehow related? Are they let me say it more directly, are these tabla exercises? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, so in poetry, there's mostly a notion of long and short. And so there's a lot of tabla compositions and Indian music compositions where there's this dichotomy. There is this dichotomy between long and short. Mm -hmm. um, that's just one kind of tabla rhythm. Of course, there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a huge variety of, of rhythms yes. that, that have developed over the years. But there is one kind of tabla kind, you know, rhythm that just does the, that plays with this dichotomy between long and short. I'll play a little bit of it tomorrow. Good. Uh, and that has its origins in, in, in the poetic uh, uh, traditions uh, of the subcontinent. Well, the two most famous names, of course, are Zakir Hussain and Ali Raka. Uh, and Father I, and son. Yeah. Hmm? Father and son. Father and son. Yeah. And I was told that Ali Raka was, his, for his entire life, only played southern rhythms. Whereas Zakir Hussain is more cosmopolitan, plays rhythms from all over India and the rest of the world. Right, right. Uh, do the, the rhythms that you have been brought, um, brought up on, are they the southern rhythms of Ali Raka um, or not? Yeah, well, I, I, I spent a long time learning from Ustad Zakir Hussain, and of course, so as a result of that, um, yeah, I get, he loves to introduce uh, rhythms from all over India. Yes. And, and the way he's been able to master so many of the different kinds and bring them together uh, has been wonderful for the, for the tradition. Uh, it used to be much more localized. You know, there'd be a, a Delhi Garana and there'd be a, um, you know, different Garanas from, 
from all over Karana just means uh, a tradition. And those traditions would not yes. be kept separate because those were localities and there wasn't that much uh, uh, internationalization, so to speak. And now, uh, yes. now, now com combining those traditions after they develop separately yes. is actually very beautiful because they've got their chance to really develop in their own way separately for a while. And now we see how they can they interact. And that's been happening now in large part because of Ustad Zakir Hussain and, and others. And it's a really exciting time and, and uh, for the subject as a result. Yeah. But again, your, the rhythms that you were brought up on, um, you, where, were, where would they be on the map? Uh, Jaipur, so near Delhi, Delhi, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And your response surprised me enormously. You actually studied with Zakir Hussain? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I, that surprises me, and I couldn't be more impressed. <laughs> that, that impresses me more than the Fields Medal, because <laughs> <laughs> I have so much respect for him. Yeah, no, he's um, incredible, and, uh, and uh, uh, has been a wonderful supporter and friend and teacher uh, nice. to me. So, uh, yeah, I can't I can't say enough yes. uh, about him and how amazing he is. Yeah. In terms of the mathematics of the rhythms. Um, are some parts of India more interesting to you? Those rhythms, I mean, they're not the same everywhere. Right. So are there some that, are they all pretty much the same mathematically, or are there some that have much more intricate, deeper mathematical structure? And I've noticed that in the south of India, the real south, I mean, I, I, the, the rhythms of, say, Alarka concept where uh, we're still, you know, the Bomb you know, Bombay uh, area. It's still in northern India, the southern part of northern India. Yes. Pretty, uh, but if you really go into the south, where they're called Karnataka, Karna Karnatic mm -hmm. rhythms. Yes. Uh, those rhythms I find incredibly mathematically intricate and complex. Uh, so I would say, like in that region, Tamil Nadu and Kerala and uh, uh, Karnataka, those the 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 rhythms there have really developed into a mathematical sophistication that it just still blows my mind. Uh, Will you be demonstrating those tomorrow? A little bit, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of these long, short kinds of things actually have the oranges in the, in the southern tradition of drumming. Uh, but tabla is mostly used for northern rhythms. But again, Ustad Zakir Hussain is one example of someone who's really crossed over. Uh, these rhythms that used to play, be played on South Indian uh, rhythmic instruments are now being played on the tabla. Uh, and lots of it has been adapted by him uh, and other tabla players today. So that, that interaction has been happening more and more. Uh, it's, there's a lot common between North Indian and South Indian drumming, Hindustani drumming and Carnatic drumming. Uh, but there was a lot that was different on the sort of mathematical side. And that, that kind of interaction, uh, maybe people in, uh, in the South would say similar things about what's happening in the North, since I grew up mostly in the Northern tradition. It just surprises me some of the kind of mathematical constructions they do in the South. And I'm sure they, that the people in the South would say things about uh, the North, uh, Northern traditions in the same way. But that interaction is now happening, and that exchange is making the music uh, even richer than they were when they were separate. Now, there is a, a sort of a folk theorem or folklore that the best computer scientists are musicians, or a lot of them are concert pianists like Scott Kim. Right, right. In India, is there a correlation between mathematical aptitude and uh, this drumming? Mm, yeah, I, th I think there is. And I think that's a worldwide thing. I think that good scientists, good mathematicians, good computer scientists, it's so common that they, they play an instrument or they paint or they do some kind of art. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty common to see. Uh, and I know Steve Jobs used to talk a lot about that. He loved to hire computer scientists that were also artists on the side or zoologists on the side uh, because he found that they made them a lot more creative, more innovative, had a, they had a feeling of aesthetics that he really needed uh, in his products to marry aesthetics and, and, uh, and the latest science. But I noticed that the, you know, the best mathematicians and scientists, you take a look at, you know, and you see that art is a, is a huge part of their lives, and music and drumming a huge part of their lives. There's something about developing both sides of the brain, the artistic side of the brain, in order to be creative, even in science. Mm -hmm. And I definitely feel that in my, uh, in my own world, that you know, if I spend enough time on art, then I'm more creative also when I think about mathematics. Yeah. The Department of Math at Princeton, are they going to start a band? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, so every year in Princeton, there is a, 
professional level <laughs> concert that's just the just math you know just the math department people uh, they're incredibly talented <laughs> musicians in the in the mathematics department, and they do have many sub little little bands that change every year. And it's well, that incredible was a, that was meant to be a joke, but I'm yeah. not surprised by your answer. Do <laughs> you know Ron Graham? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course, he has he's expressed his his um, skills through juggling. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but I consider and acrobatics and yeah, acrobatics. Great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the juggling, I think, is an expression of artistic expression for him, the way it is for Absolutely, yeah. drumming is for yeah. other people. And trampoline and, uh, and trampoline. Oh, he's, I mean, all this. He's a, he's a multi-talented right, man. Right, right, right. I first met him walking on his hands down the hall at Bell Labs. <laughs> yeah, same here, actually. <laughs> I actually worked one summer at Bell Labs. Uh, when he was the chief <laughs> scientist, and I went to his office, and there he is in his funny acrobatic positions. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is Professor Graham. <laughs> yes, uh, he's 80 now, so we'll, we'll, we'll. I don't know if he does that anymore. I but think he still trampolines. So there you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, are there any other relationships that perhaps that you've learned here from G4G uh, that you will? want to explore when you get back? Are you, I mean, because there's so much being proposed and floated around here. Have you discovered some new Oh my gosh, this, uh, relationships? No, this conference has been incredible. Uh, it's information overload. <laughs> I see. My brain is full, but there's certainly lots of things that have stimulated uh, the mind for me <laughs> in the past few days. Okay. And yeah, definitely. I think uh, lots of the ideas of tessellations and painting and <laughs> I love that so many people are interested in mathematics and art here at G4G, in addition to mathematics and magic, of course, which uh, is another one of my interests. Uh, I, w I meant to get back to the magic then. I did not know you had a real interest in magic. That's the reason I asked you earlier if you had gone which direction your talk came from, whether it came from magic to math or math to magic. You do have an interest in magic. Uh, uh, you quoted from Paul Bearer's review. Now, no one knows about Paul Bear's review who's not a magician, <laughs> all right, because it's not sold to the public. Right. Uh, are you, is this something that you, part of your own magic library? Uh, yeah, no, I, I went and spent a lot of time with Paul Bear's review in, in Conjuring Arts, which is a magic library in New York City. Oh, yes. Uh, where, they keep, uh, where they keep this, uh, this it's, it's the best library of magic it's in the fantastic. world. fantastic, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just fun to just sit there and read. And, Okay. See the amazing ideas that come through. The kind of creativity that you see in some of these magic journals, it's very reminiscent of the kind of creativity you look for in mathematics journals. You know, the kinds of ideas that people come up with to solve certain magical problems. You know, here are the constraints. We want to be able to do this, uh, and we want this kind of effect. And here are, the, you know, here are our constraints. Can we solve it? And then, they, and then sometimes they go and solve it. Sometimes they loosen the hypotheses yes. uh, in the same way that you know, mathematicians do. So I find a... a quite a parallel between solving magical problems and solving mathematical problems. Well, you don't need to be told that Gardner had a long, lifelong interest in magic. Yeah, of course. First well, published in 1930 and he last published in 2010. Right, And right. pretty much every year in between. Right. And, um, and he, of course, subscribed, as you know, wrote for Paul Bear's right. review as well. Right, and he was right. a good friend of Carl Follis. Right, right. And, um, yeah. No, a lot of what I, how I got interested in that. I mean, I never practiced magic so much growing up, but I loved reading Martin Gardner and things that he recommended to read, sort of as a, just the theoretical problem solving of magic, mm -hmm. is something that I really, I really enjoyed, and I learned a lot of that from Martin Gardner. I out. see. Yeah. Um, and then later on, Percy Diaconis. Uh, when I, I'm sorry. Uh, later on, uh, when I went to college, yes. uh, my thesis advisor, one of my thesis advisors, was Percy Diaconis. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah. Percy, so, <laughs> you you've led a charmed <laughs> life. Uh. I'm very lucky. Yeah. yeah to have had the chance to see his perspective on, uh, oh, yes. on the subject. And, and Percy Dicones has a lot of good Gardner stories that I don't want to repeat for you, but right, right. <laughs> they had a deep, re deep relationship. They sure did, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to ask you about shuffling, because you mentioned shuffling briefly in your lecture. Mm. Uh, but I don't need to ask, because now I know you learned about the relationship to shuffling from Percy Dicones. Oh, one yeah. Of the, one we, of the experts. Talked, we certainly talked a lot about shuffling. Uh, I, of course, read about those things before I came to college, but I was ready, <laughs> yeah. I was ready to go talk to him when I arrived. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, he learned magic from Di, Di Vernon. Vernon. Yeah. So, uh, so can we say that you learned magic from Percy? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly a lot of, uh, 
lot of stuff on the theoretical side I definitely learned Because from he him. apparently yeah. practices many hours a day even now. Uh, right. It's very hard to get him to, <laughs> to show us. <laughs> but occasionally, if he's in the mood, we'll get to see some of it. But only when I started meeting more magicians did I realize his, uh, his repute in the magic world. I mean, in the, in the, oh, in the really? math world, you know, he's in the mathematics department. People don't really know. Yes, yes. Uh, I but mean, he's, he's not, an amazing mathematician. But he's not so a number theorist. Uh, not a number theorist. He's not he's a number theorist. theorist. He's kind of an everythingist in some yes. sense. He, he looks for magic everywhere, wherever it's found, and then he jumps into it. <laughs> Uh, so uh, he's, had, he's had connections to number theory every once in a while. Well, uh, well let me ask you about your prehistory, because anybody who goes from Percy Diaconis to Andrew Wiles must have had a, a good resume before that. What, what <laughs> did you do to come to these people's attention? <laughs> no, actually, I never, <laughs> I didn't have much of a, I uh, didn't have much of a. Uh, uh, were you, did you win some famous competition, or did you? Have a uh, no, actually, my yeah. I mean, before I got to college, I mostly was learning on my own or with my family or spending time in Jaipur, India, and learning yeah. tabla or learning with my grandfather. So I wasn't really on the radar of any anything national or international. I was just sort of doing things on my own with family, not going to school very much. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, you, you must have either performed well or been a personally interesting person to somebody like, like uh, <laughs> Percy Diaconis. So, uh, so re however you did it, <laughs> it's, it was a uh, harbinger of your, your future success. That's all good. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what else should you, can you tell me about your, I mean, we really can't talk about your mathematics, your theorems and your, <laughs> and your, and your recent research. But is there anything else we should know now that, now that we know you're a magician and interested in puzzles and interested in the mathematics of rhythms and so forth? Uh, is there perhaps something else I haven't for asked you about that <laughs> would be relevant to the G4G community? Uh, no, I think you covered quite a lot. <laughs> covered quite a lot. Okay, well, that's quite enough. I just feel like I, uh, I, I would hate to learn after we left the room that there was something else that you did that I, I should have asked about. No, but no, it was quite enough. Uh, and your accomplishments in all these areas are extraordinary. So we, we're happy that you're here. No, it's and been a pleasure uh, continued success. And thank you for coming. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's Bye -bye. been a great pleasure. Thank you.